thank you very much. It's uh, wonderful to see so many people here. And it is um, a great honour to be asked to do the annual Amnesty International lecture here in Belfast. And before I um, talk about the immensely serious um, subjects tonight, it was just um, before I start, it was just a uh, thought that um, it has, in fact, been a slightly curious few weeks that I have spent uh, talking mostly about dancing competitions. Uh, and for those of you who have been watching Strictly and uh, my husband Ed's performances over the, uh, the last few weeks, I have to say it has been some, um, uh, I've had some pleasure as a woman politician to be reading so many articles about my spouse's outfits in the papers, <laughs> even if they are yellow suits. But look, this is a great honour to be here um, for uh, such an important uh, lecture and the work that has been done over very many years um, by Amnesty International as well. I was uh, asked to come to speak many months ago based on the work that I'd been doing as part of the refugee task force that we established uh, over a year ago and long before being elected to be the chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee in Parliament yesterday. So it's based on the work of the task force rather than the work of the Select Committee that I'm talking this evening. And for me, it is an opportunity to pay tribute to the work of Amnesty International, which was the first campaigning organisation that I joined at the age of 16, even before I joined the Labour Party. And an organisation forged to champion our common humanity to defend human rights, to demand justice for the persecuted, and a powerful voice against torture and slavery across the world. And Amnesty asked me to talk tonight about fixing the refugee crisis. And if only we could fix this in just a couple of hours debate tonight. But we face a global crisis where over 60 million people have lost their homes, where as we speak, the expected fighting in, Mos in Mosul could create hundreds of thousands more refugees on top of the half a million who fled when ISIL first took over the city. When the current framework of international support for refugees and human rights is being undermined, and when many European countries are cutting back support for refugees rather than increasing it, and when the Republican candidate for US president is campaigning to stop a country which for so many years has given sanctuary to the persecuted from taking any Muslim refugees. And when no one seems to want to offer leadership the crisis needs. But impossible a title as it may seem to talk about fixing anything, I want to argue tonight that there is far more that we can do together. First, that there are practical things that governments across the world could be doing now that would help. Action that is not beyond the wit of different institutions and nations, societies, to save lives, ease suffering, and give back some hope to those who are desperate. Action for the United Kingdom, which involves most immediately working with France to solve the problems in Calais. And second, to argue that we need to face up to the difficult political debates over the refugee crisis and not run away from them. That we should be honest about and respond to the genuine concerns people have and the reassurance people need, but also to have the confidence to argue the moral case for compassion, for humanitarianism and solidarity with those who are persecuted. And we should take heart from the willingness of so many people across the world to help those who are fleeing torture or conflict. And it is with those inspiring stories of generosity and compassion that I want to start. Because we're gathering tonight here in Belfast, just down the road from what was once Mooney's Bar in Corn Market, where 80 years ago, members of the Refugee Aid Committee and the Belfast Hebrew Congregation signed a lease for a derelict farm in County Down to provide a new home for refugees who were fleeing the Nazis. And in the summer of 1939, the first children from the kinder transport arrived here in Belfast. And over the next 10 years, around 300 children and adults were to pass through what they called the refugee resettlement farm, welcomed into local schools, running the local farm, teenage boys who joined the local air, army, or air training corps, a Hungarian refugee with a degree in agriculture who became the farm manager, a saxophone player from Vienna who looked after the children, 
A girl who grew up became a nurse in one of the local hospitals. All helped by the Refugee Aid Committee, which raised funds from the Jewish communities in Belfast and Dublin, and helped by the Committee for German Refugees, funded by the joint Christian churches, including Presbyterians, Catholics, Methodists, the Church of Ireland and Quakers. The people of Northern Ireland coming together to give sanctuary to those fleeing persecution and doing the same again today. When the government started the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme last year, after we had campaigned for more action to help refugees, Belfast was one of the first places to help. Some of the first families arrived here last December, and hundreds of people now are being given a future back, again in Belfast, in Londonderry, welcomed by leaders of all faiths. Often it is helping women and children who are most at risk, those needing medical help, those who survive torture and violence. And some of the charities, some of the international charities that I've spoken to have told me that the support from the Northern Ireland executive, from local councils, from local communities here for the refugees who've arrived is among the best in the United Kingdom. But for all that Northern Ireland is working so hard to help, the truth is we face a global humanitarian crisis of the like we have not seen since the Second World War. The highest levels of displacement on record, over 20 million refugees, and thus far the worst of the crisis has been driven by events in Syria. And when the government talks about the pull factor, just think about what is the push factor. Cities like Aleppo, where bombs launched by the Syrian regime rip through reinforced concrete, creating craters 20 meters wide. So there is no bunker, no cellar in which families can hide. No wonder people run. There's a seven-year-old girl on Twitter, and like any of the rest of us, she and her mum post missives in 140 characters about their daily lives. Only Bana Alabed and her mum live in Aleppo, and they tweet as the bombs are falling. Tweet things like, I'm reading to forget the war. I miss school so much. Oh dear God, 11 bombs fall in 15 minutes. All last night was raining bombs. But it isn't just Syria. From Eritrea, girls being trafficked. In Yemen, conflict leaving hundreds of thousands of children facing severe malnutrition. In Libya, the instability allowing criminal and smuggler gangs to trade in people's lives. Set against the millions now living in tented cities in Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, and Iraq, in Europe, we see a smaller part of the crisis, but it is still bleak. Two and a half thousand people drowned in the Mediterranean. 150,000 people arriving in Italy this year on dangerous smuggler boats, and over 50,000 refugees stranded in Greece in flimsy tents, and winter is coming. But old institutions are struggling to respond. The UNHCR, set up to deal with humanitarian refugee crises, stretched far beyond its capacity. Pledges of international aid from governments across the world too often not being honored, too often being delayed. The recent New York summit and the US president's meeting to increase resettlement, frankly, a disappointment. And as hundreds of thousands have, have crossed our own continent, European governments arguing over how to cope. So the original EU plan to relocate tens of thousands of refugees and asylum seekers has completely failed. Four countries alone have taken most of the strain, Greece, Italy, Germany, and Sweden. And in Eastern Europe, governments have been refusing point blank to do their bit. And in France and the United Kingdom, a 12-month standoff over what to do about the dangerous and inhumane Calais camp. So here's the first point that I want to make. We need a far stronger global response to the refugee crisis, because if we don't, it will get much worse. We will be failing in our moral duty to try to help fellow human beings who are suffering, but we will also be putting the security and stability of many more nations at risk too, and that threatens us all. Too many countries are getting sucked into a kind of beggar thy neighbor approach, turning their backs and hoping that others will take the strain. And the trouble is, that means those states that shoulder the greatest burden then struggle to cope and face far greater instability and insecurity as a result. That undermines public support and becomes reason again 
for neighbouring governments to dig their heels even deeper in. So we get caught in a vicious spiral in which criminals and extremists can exploit the disorder, in which more people suffer, and in which international agreements like the 1951 Refugee Convention of Shared Responsibility are undermined. Instead, we need countries to work together to tackle the crisis, to make it easier for everyone. Concerted international action to tackle the conflicts and causes that drive people from their homes. Support for civilians in conflicts, creating safe passage routes. More aid and investment for neighbouring countries that host most of the refugees. And that is one area where the UK government has taken a lead, but we need more to follow. Including, too, the education and employment that families badly need, so they don't need to embark on perilous onward journeys to give their children any chance of a future. Help for host communities, like the investment in new schools for Lebanese children, to ease the strain that they can face from a crisis on their doorstep. And countries further afield, including the UK, need to do their bit too by providing far more safe, legal, managed routes to sanctuary, including resettlement and family reunion. So yes, the UK should be doing more. Action too against the smuggler gangs, the traffickers and criminals who profit from people's desperation. And safeguards for security, including the proper border and security checks to stop extremists or gangs exploiting the crisis. A robust asylum system, so those who are not refugees and who have safe home to return to, do in fact return to maintain public confidence in the system. And plans for integration, to ensure respect for the values, culture and laws of the country that has welcomed refugees in. And crucially, the things that Amnesty has always called for, respect for the dignity and human rights of all. And that means much stronger action to safeguard children from abuse, something we should take far more seriously than I think previous generations have taken when refugee crises in the past. Much greater understanding, too, of the risks of modern slavery and sexual exploitation by criminal gangs. And a clear responsibility always on the authorities to treat everyone, be they in need of sanctuary or not, in a humane way. And let me say something particular about Calais, that small corner of the refugee crisis that is closest to our home. Because while we might not be able to fix the global crisis, surely two great nations, France and the United Kingdom, should be able to fix the problems in Calais. Because Calais should be a stain on all of our consciences. For too long, France has said it's a problem for the UK, but the UK government has said it's up to the French. And that standoff has left people suffering and at risk. No one should be living in the squalid, inhumane and dangerous conditions of the Calais camp. For people, and especially children, to be stuck in a place like this in Northern Europe should shame us all. Ghettoized and lawless camps where criminal and trafficking gangs can exploit and threaten can never be an answer to the refugee crisis. And the camp is dangerous, and no one should be stuck there for another Christmas. Of course, it is France's responsibility to deal with this crisis in their country. But countries need to work together, and that's why the UK should also be doing its bit to help. The French authorities have announced plans to close the camp within days, but it is a serious concern that there isn't yet a proper plan, especially for those most at risk. There must be enough safe accommodation for people to go to, UNHCR involvement and monitoring to make sure that intervention is safely done and a proper process for asylum and immigration assessments so refugees get the urgent help they need and those who are not refugees return home. And there needs to be a proper strategy to prevent people ending up in Calais in the first place, including action to stop the trafficking gangs so the camp isn't just rebuilt somewhere else along the French coast. And so yes, the United Kingdom needs to do its bit too. After long delays, the government is now rightly honouring its obligations under the Dublin Agreement to take children and teenagers who have family here to look after them. And I welcome what the Home Secretary has done in the last few weeks to tackle the bureaucratic delays that were putting lives at risk. But there are many more children and teenagers with no family anywhere to look after them who are far more vulnerable and urgent action is needed. Children and teenagers who Parliament agreed to help when in May we passed the amendment put forward 
by Lord Alf Dubbs. Alf, who arrived himself in Britain as a child of the kinder transport many decades ago. The French authorities have been working to provide alternative accommodation for adults, but still there is huge concern there is not safe provision for children. And despite the UK promise to help, progress has been too slow, and aid workers in Calais say nothing is yet in place to register or identify these children or teenagers or to get them to safety either in France or the UK. There are still children as young as 10, primary school kids, who are trapped in Calais. There are teenagers who've been assessed by UK social workers as having experienced extreme trauma, and many of them at risk of suicide. And as we sit here, 43 unaccompanied girls deemed to be at extreme risk of sexual exploitation. Teenagers like Helen, who's 16, who's been there for a month. She left Eritrea after her mother died. With nowhere to go, she lived on the streets of the capital, alone and scared, fled to Europe, and ended up in Calais. When she's asked what she misses about home, she simply says nothing. She describes life in the camp in Calais as a war. Scary and noisy, especially at night. And last week, she witnessed an Eritrean man get killed trying to jump onto a fast-moving lorry. Someone asked me why most of the unaccompanied children are boys. Because the girls don't stay unaccompanied for very long. Very quickly, they are picked up by adult men, too often by trafficking and prostitution rings, and they are at the greatest risk of all. Last time when part of the camp was cleared, 120 children and teenagers just disappeared, very probably into the arms of some of those trafficking gangs. 10,000 children, according to Europol, have disappeared across Europe, with nobody knowing where they have gone. And so now urgently, France and the United Kingdom need to work together to provide rapid safeguarding and sanctuary for these children and young people to get them into safe accommodation before any demolition of the camp begins. And let's just end the standoff. France and the UK should take half the children and teenagers each and get them into safety. Countries working together to do their bit. But here's my second point. Because all the practical policies in the world are no use if we cannot sustain political support to implement them. And because governments have struggled to manage the crisis, it makes it far easier for far-right parties to play on people's fears. So when organised crime and gangs can profit from desperation, when lorry drivers worry for their safety crossing the channel, when asylum and border checks aren't completed, when no one knows where children disappear, when there isn't enough accommodation for those arriving or enough policing to stop the kind of trouble that we saw in Cologne last January, it is little wonder that people get worried. And far-right and xenophobic parties right across Europe have been able to exploit that anxiety to undermine people's compassion and willingness to help. But that should not be reason to turn away, because in fact if we do, the crisis will just get worse and the far-right will have even more disorder to exploit. Instead, we should be working together to manage the crisis, to bring order as well as compassion, so we maintain public support for doing the right thing and to always challenge the kind of vile posters like the one Nigel Farage stood in front of during the referendum that was deeply wrong to exploit the suffering of refugees. And I don't think we should interpret the Brexit vote in the referendum as a reason for the UK to withdraw from its international obligations to help refugees. Because yes, in many parts of the country, certainly in my constituency in Yorkshire, people were worried about immigration. But immigration and asylum are different. It is perfectly possible to worry about the pace and scale of migration, but also to want to do your bit to help those fleeing persecution, just as the United Kingdom has always done. And just as the people of Northern Ireland did, when the kinder transport children arrived many decades ago, and just as you are doing again now with Syrian refugees. And it's why even though politicians across the country have become very worried about immigration too, we still achieved overwhelming support earlier this year in Parliament for the Dubs Amendment for the UK to do much more to help child refugees. 
So we should be ready to persuade, ready to convince, ready to argue all over again from first principles why it is that we share a common humanity, why we should do our bit to help those fleeing persecution or torture, to do what Amnesty International has always done, defending rights that too often we take for granted, championing a humanity that is precious, and taking heart from the millions of people across the country and across the world who want to help others and who know that there but for the grace of God go any one of us. Fixing the refugee crisis is hard, but making a difference isn't. And as Amnesty has shown, every life saved, every individual freed from torture, every family lifted from persecution, every child given back a future is a candle lit in the darkness for others to follow on. Thank you very much.